I do not believe in imposter syndrome. I don't believe it's a real thing. I think that's a, a term that someone made up to give us another reason to feel shitty about ourselves, and I'm not on board. This is Into the Deep with Catherine Just, a podcast devoted to the evolution of consciousness, connection, and inspired creative expression. Hi, everybody, and welcome back. Today, I'm so excited because I have a dear friend with me, Alan Joseph Marks, who I know because he took one of my self-portraiture courses a couple of years ago during the pandemic, and then we became friends. I'm grateful that he lives in Los Angeles because I get to see his art and his process, and I get great feedback from him about my work. And just recently, he curated my work for a show that he is putting together in his gallery space that will be showing in April. I'm going to let him tell you more about himself. Like Catherine said, uh, my name is Alan Joseph Marks and I, I do a lot of things. I'm that multi-hyphenate person. I paint and I take photographs and I was an actor in my 20s and I've done stand-up comedy and I'm taking a writing class right now. I don't know if I'm a writer, but I'm taking a writing class and I am starting to turn my attention toward curating. I'm really curious about what that is and I want to do it more and continue with my own art practice and meet people and talk and live a long time. I love it. One thing that I find fascinating about you, as an artist, you don't limit yourself to one medium. You are using paint and photography and you're writing now. And I'm curious about that because many artists are told to pick one thing and become a master at it, become masterful at the one thing. And you give yourself permission to follow your inspiration. I'd love to hear just more about that piece of your process. I think for myself and maybe for any artist, I think the only thing we really have to master is curiosity. Stay curious, right? Remain curious about the world around us, about the people around us, about the materials that we can use, even if they're not considered traditional materials one would use to make art. When I was in my young 20s, I remember one of my community college art teachers saying, I never go to the art store, I go to the hardware store. That's where I get all my inspiration. And it was uh, just the door open. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. I can go anywhere. I can use any material. I can paint or draw on any material I want. It could be paper or canvas, drywall, stone, pages out of the phone book. Remember phone books? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I think the most important thing for any maker of anything is to remain curious. And as the world evolves and technology evolves and changes, we will only have more and more options for materials. Yeah, that's a good point. I love that you said that remaining curious is the thing. I'm the same. I like making and photography. I like sewing on things. I like writing on things. I like so many things. And I let it lead that curiosity lead. Did you go to art school? I did not go to art school. I went to community college for a long time. I had the ambition of going to a very prestigious art school in California. I toured. It didn't happen. I got sidetracked. We can go into that later if you want. But no, I did not uh, go to a formal art school. And I think that's a, actually an advantage. I did go to formal art school. And one of the things that I have been doing ever since is breaking down my idea from school of what it means to make art and what art is. That's fine art. That's not fine art. It can be debilitating. So I, I love hearing that you just give yourself permission. And I think I have a real problem with that term outsider artist. Yeah. Because I did not go through academia, maybe I don't have the full understanding of what that means to be an outsider artist. But I find it's just like another wall that's put up. It's like another obstacle created by the gatekeepers. And I don't know, I hope that these young kids coming up will smash down all those ideas and make gatekeepers obsolete. And maybe that's what's happening with social media, too. Maybe the gatekeep gatekeepers are becoming obsolete. Or maybe they're just going to take a new form, too. That could also happen. But the thing that I'm most proud of is that I've just, I've stuck with it. I have hung in there. And I've just kept doing the thing that I do. I've kept doing the thing that I love. I keep finding new things that I love. And what is it now that you love? What is inspiring you in your work right now? 
oh God, so many things. Things that I find that I return to is I often return to drawing and making marks. I'm a mark maker. I love to make marks. I love to draw. I have a uh, lifelong drawing practice that started long before I even understood that, oh, this is art. It was something I always did as a kid, as a very young kid. So yeah, returning to drawing, making marks on a surface. What inspires me is doing it wrong and that spirit of rebellion to be like, I'm going to do this wrong. I have respect for the rules. I have respect for technique. I have, res I have respect for craft and respect for the mistakes and the lessons that those who have come before me have learned and are generous enough to share with me. I have a lot of respect for that. But at the same time, when I, <laughs> and when I get all that information, the question that is always on the table is, okay, cool, but how can I do it wronger? Is there a wronger way? I love that so much. Is there a wronger way? I really appreciated that when you were taking the, the class that you were in, that you would say, make bad work. Yeah, I think it's, I heard someone the other day, of course, on social media, talking about how artists live in chaos and create order out of chaos and I of course my first reaction was oh, shut the fuck up but then I was like maybe that's true like I know for instance there's a painting I'm working on right now and it feels very much like it is in a state of chaos there's a lot going on in there now I'm at the point where I'm like okay there's a system here and I need to simplify it or streamline it or make it make more sense. This system needs to make more sense. We need to create some sort of order or cohesion or rhythm visually, aesthetically out of this chaos that is currently on the surface, right? Yeah, I have a question though about that. How do you know? Is it a physical feeling of this is chaotic and I need to make marks that shift that? How do you- It's physical, it's intuitive. It's rhythm and it's story. When I, in my 20s, like I said, I got sidetracked from this ambition of going to this very prestigious art school and I ended up studying acting and I studied very intensely for about five, minutes, um, like six years with this one guy. And I learned a lot about story because the play or anything like that is a story. There's a beginning, a middle and an end. Not always in that order. Sometimes the end can be the beginning. So, yeah. I but that. that lesson I learned there, I have carried it into my visual work as well that there is a beginning, a middle, and an end. And when I stand back and look at a piece, there has to be a visual beginning, a middle, and an end. The way that my eye travels through the piece or travels from this corner to that corner, and it's emotional, it's visceral it's aesthetic it could be colors it could be texture even if it's a very recognizable image like a very straightforward portrait of someone for me when i look at it, it still goes through that filter of what's the story here is there a beginning is there a middle is there an end why is it successful or and that end doesn't have to be like final it can be really open-ended it can be vague it can be anything. It can be any kind of a beginning, any kind of a middle, any kind of an end. But those three things need to be there in some capacity and they don't have to be balanced. That is fascinating. It's better if they're not. Actually, it's better if they're not balanced. I like things to be a little bit asymmetrical. A little you know what I mean? Tension. A little bit of tension, like this could fall over or like any of that. And I love that. I love that you said... And I'm so glad we're recording it because I wanted to grab a pen. I'm like, wait, it's on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Just that piece about it needs to have a beginning, middle and an end. And it doesn't have to be in that order. That made my head explode a, a little bit there. Uh -huh. That the end could be, it could start with the end. It, it isn't linear necessarily. And then it doesn't have to be balanced. And the tension of it not being balanced is a thing that's just really interesting. And it brings me to a couple things. One is when you came over to look at my work and you started pulling out my images, you were doing that. It was three images together. Yeah. And I was looking at you like, what are you doing to my work, dude? This is not how I made this. This was not my intention. I don't see it. My whole body was reacting to. I could feel it. Yeah, I could, I could feel uh, it. And, and you did it 
twice. <laughs> and it's been interesting to see these two stories up beginning, middle, end. And I'm looking at them every single day when I wake up, but they're like hanging in front of me on in the bedroom so I can reassess what they mean now. And now hearing what you're saying about this, it just makes so much more sense and deepens my understanding of what these could be about on my side, not on your side, but what is this in terms of story? Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. And it also brings me to a question that you and I got to when you were over looking at my work was, when do you know when it, you're done? When do you know if something's complete and finished? I don't know that there's one answer to that. I guess the simplest way I can say that is we intuitively know when it is done. And what that means for me is when it when the work or the piece or the story has come to its most natural conclusion, right? And that can still mean unfinished, but it's most natural conclusion, right? And sometimes, I love that story about Marcel Duchamp's glass, right? He did that painting on the glass that traveled. And, it, and then at some point in its life, years, over the span of years, it dropped and it cracked. And he was like, oh, now it's done. And it happened completely out of his control. I but love he, that. So I leave that totally open as, oh, it could go as far as that. Or it can be like, I put the film in the camera. I shot the roll. I did the portrait. I pick this one. It's printed, beautiful. It's framed. It's on a wall. It's done. It can yeah. be that simple as well. So, and so you're just leading with intuition and being open to exploring what the elements have to say about it too. Absolutely. I can put all the final markings on a piece. The paint is dry, all the markings are there, and it's done. And then it's time for it to be framed. And yeah. then there's a then there's like a whole like other series of like, what's the right way to frame it? Then suddenly I realize, oh, this piece isn't done until it's framed, so that it has to be framed. Okay, cool, it's in the frame. Oh my God, look, it looks amazing, it's done. But then it becomes part of a show. And then it's, oh, now it's in this context. So now it has this new life. So now yeah. the end is another beginning. It, so. is, it is. Oh my gosh. Look at you making poetry out of all of it. <laughs> it's so true that framing has actually, there's a friend of mine, Eric Joseph, who is the king of printing digital. And he would say, your prints aren't, your work isn't done until it's printed. It's not real until I it's agree. printed. And I, I would get stuck with, but what paper do I pick? Right. And just not move forward. And what texture and what weight should the paper be? Yes. Yes. Like yes. And then framing it becomes this whole other thing. It is just, uh, for me, it has been a very tedious part of the process. On that, in response to that, I'll say sometimes the wrong choice has to be made. Like sometimes I just have to make a choice. I, the decision just has to be made, even if it's not the best right decision. Yes. That part of getting to the best right decision is to make the wrong decision along the way. Like I know that like I'm someone who needs a long runway. I need a lot of time. I am not, a, I work better under pressure person. I'm not that person. I don't understand those people. I don't believe they're telling the truth when they say it. <laughs> I don't believe it. I think this might be a controversial thing to say, but I'm going to say it. Say when it. people say I work better under pressure, I think what they're trying to do is justify their procrastination and possibly some untreated mental illness. Can I add to that? That's, that's my opinion. Yes. Can I say too, that when working under pressure, it also gives you an out to facing discomfort on any, for any amount of time. Yes. The discomfort of a timeline is, is uncomfortable, but a personal going deep with your work, letting yourself be uncomfortable inside the unknown of your process and what for a pro acted length of time yeah oh, but i will say my experience has taught me that when i allow myself to be in that discomfort for a protracted or extended amount of time what i discover along the way like the mistakes i make along the way lead me to the best natural conclusion because i've had the time to exhaust everything and it isn't just making the decision it's living with the decision you can make the decision, but then for me anyway, I have to live with it for a while because I'm going to take a nap or I'm going to eat a sandwich and I'm going to feel different. And coming back to, I like having it hanging in my house and walking past it all the time. I'm changing. The artist telling me different things. The light is changing. It's making an impression on the art too of how I'm seeing it. The way that I view a, 
And I like putting a lot of images up. And then somebody gave this assignment. I can't remember who, but they said, put all the art up, small four by six pictures if you're doing photography. And every day, go past it and take one off. Yes, editing. Yes, editing. And, and then see if the story is still strong without that picture. And more often than not, it is. And that gets to getting attached to certain pieces. I do that. I make a piece. It means so much to me. And then other people come in and they look at the bigger picture of my work and they pull it. And I think, oh, not that one. But if you are detached from your own personal feelings about what that meant to you, and you look at the story, like you were saying in the beginning, is it helpful or not? And you, I kept trying to put my favorite art in front of your fate. But what about this one? What about this one? You're like, nope, nope. And I had attachment to certain pieces being seen. Yeah, yes, I've a lot of things I want to say in response to that. So, well, first, the first thing I thought of was not only when you start to remove things. Yes, the story is still as strong, but I would argue that most of the time the story is stronger because there's less static, right? The story becomes more succinct. And so it just becomes stronger because yes. it, it, it's more immediate and there's less veering, right? Yes. Yes. And that comes from time. So going back to this idea of when do you know that you're done, I have come to realize that, first of all, let me backtrack a tiny bit. When you were talking about being attached to this image or that image, as time passes, I'm finding that I'm becoming, that I'm better at detaching from this piece, that piece, this piece, that piece. Now, I do work a lot in series, right? Like I have a lifelong drawing practice. I have a lot of drawings that all are very similar. And years ago, I wanted to show them all at the same time. And now I'm very much out of that, out of those 40 drawings. Maybe I can show five. Wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. these three encapsulate the entire thing. Yeah. And it and to not be attached to the work. I also feel like part of what makes a work complete is when it goes out into the world. Right. When it the experience of making it is a hundred percent mine. That yeah. experience is hundred percent mine. Yeah. The doing it, the thinking about it, the research, everything involved in getting it to where it's quote complete or done that's all mine but once it is done it is not mine anymore it needs to get the hell out of my life <laughs> <laughs> and go do its thing because that's what's going to really complete it is when others can experience it and have their opinion which is none of my business i love that. i care what anyone yeah. else's opinion is there are like two people who i really care what they think and i will listen to it i will take it in i will hear it I will most often make an adjustment if it's, you know what I mean? Yeah. But but the world en masse, you can't, or I can't. Some no. people do. I, so I, many people do and they don't make work. And I've thrown out the whole idea of perfection. I'm not a perfectionist. I am not a perfectionist. Not I mean, I, if anything, I'm a sloppiest. I love that so much. A sloppiest. <laughs> I know. I I really love getting my hands dirty and, I really resonate with a lot of your process and practice so much. And I'm getting to know you on a, on a whole other level, which I so appreciate. And you're saying some things that I think can be so helpful to all of us in getting out of our own way and making the work that wants to come through and getting it out of our house. Like I was told that I'm an art hoarder. Like I don't have many things in my home except for my artwork is everywhere. And I'm like holding onto it. Like why? <laughs> it's in boxes under your sofa. <laughs> it is. I know you were just like pulling boxes out from yourself. Like, oh, God, there's so much under there. <laughs> Working on it. And yeah, no, but, and who was it? I think it was Andy Warhol was like, was quoted as saying, don't worry, I'm going to totally get this wrong. I apologize to anyone who actually <laughs> is. But basically the idea was make your work. Don't worry about whether it's good or bad. While other people are debating about that, make more work. That is it. I love, and I like that. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Like, I can't, I don't have time. I, I, I Back when I was in my twenties, when I was trying to be an actor, I did a play and I remember the Los Angeles times and the LA weekly came on the same night to review the play. They saw the exact same show. They saw the same show. 
one of them said the show was too fast and I couldn't follow it. The other one said it was too slow. And I was like, they saw the same fucking show. Yeah. They saw the same fucking thing. And I was like, all right. And at that point I was like, for sure, it doesn't matter. doesn't matter. Because all of us up there on that stage had the fucking night of our lives. We had so much fun. We all felt really good. So that's what matters. That is right. I love that you said that. I had two art mentors at the same time and I showed them the same art and they had opposing opinions. And that's when I realized it comes back to me. It always comes back to me and everybody's going to have an opinion. And I appreciate those two very much. And it forced me to take responsibility for my work and make the decisions I felt were right about it and keep making the work. And here's the next question. Yes. Right? I'm like pointing at you. <laughs> the next question is, why make work? Why make work? I've gone through periods where I haven't made work and it didn't treat me so good. <laughs> Why? 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 What's the difference? Just I, when I'm not making work or I'm not thinking about making work or I'm just not engaged or involved in a practice, my practice, whatever that might be. It's just, I just don't feel right. I feel off. I don't feel good about oh. the world. I don't feel good about myself. I don't feel good about you. I don't feel good about, like, I just don't feel good about stuff. And a tortured artist. I'm tortured when I'm not being an artist. Like, that's interesting. Actually, like, doing the work, even doing it badly, even doing it wrong, doing it badly, making bad paintings. I've made plenty of bad paintings. I've taken plenty of bad photographs. Still better than not doing. I, I relate to having an ache to create. Yeah. Yeah. So it is about feeling better. Yes. So, talk a little bit about perfectionism again and like making quote bad work is like the thing I love about shooting film on a roll of 35 millimeter film you have 36 chances to take a great photograph so I like very early on was like one out of 36 makes me a rock star yes that's what they said in art school if you made one really well crafted image then you win and it doesn't and just to Say poke it. a hole in this idea it could yeah. be a total mistake yeah it could oh be a yes you didn't expect totally yeah. unexpected yes i love it when i don't look through the lens or something happened like you were saying about your work or that piece of glass that shattered and then you said now it's done i'm really interested in that too the what happens that has nothing to do with me really i just intuitively i put my camera up and took a picture and then i look and i'm like this is God's work. <laughs> this is it's that thing of the creative impulse, the creative urge, right? It's just yes. like it's, I'm just like nudging something out there and it's engaging with the world and with time and it collides with this or with that. Mm -hmm. There's a collision and then a third thing is made. But it takes that nudge, right? Like that nudge to okay, work, let's start you. And then you start it and then can we talk about that little nudge about starting? Because my question is about needing to sometimes nudge yourself into the making and that fear or per perfectionism or comparing or whatever's happening in your head is present. And I'm wondering if that becomes present fear before you make or in the middle of it, what do you do? What tools do you have to rely on to get you through to continuing to make your work? There's a couple of things. One of the most important things that I discovered along the way is that years ago, I told myself I'm painting, I'm doing a thing. And I reach a point where I'm like, Ugh, that moment of discussion. That's when I'm like, you know what? I can have an opinion tomorrow. Interesting. So that's also like my cue of, I guess I'm done for the day. Like, I think I've taken this as far as it can go. I don't know what I'm looking at. Either I need to step away. I need to put some food in my face. I need to take a walk or I just need to stop and have an opinion tomorrow. This isn't going anywhere. I can have an opinion tomorrow. And then tomorrow, I see it totally differently than I did in that moment where I thought this is terrible. I might yeah. see it, I know what a likely correction might be here. And then I proceed. But for me, it's step away. Now, if I'm starting something new, I don't know, I'm just a starter. You know what I mean? I'm just a starter. Like I said, it's like, it goes back to that idea of make it chaotic and then start to refine and I just make marks. I just shoot film. Like I shot plenty of rolls of film where I'm like, this was a waste. This was a waste. This was a waste. Gets you to the next thing. Right. Like sometimes the only way out is through. And, and I do want to make this point as well. Cause I feel it, that it's important is that 
because I hear people talk about this all the time and it just makes me scratch my head. I do not believe in imposter syndrome. I don't believe it's a real thing. I think that's a, a term that someone made up to give us another reason to feel shitty about ourselves. And I'm not on board. You're not buying it. No, it's I'm not buying a ticket to get on that train because it doesn't go. What anywhere. is it? What you mean? It's just. I, here's the thing. I have certainly been in the company of people who are more talented than me, better educated, more ambitious, more advantaged, better looking, taller, all the. the Fill in the blank. Yeah. But that never made me feel like a fake. That doesn't make me feel like a fake because for a couple of reasons. One is there's whatever the thing is inside of me that makes me want to draw or paint or take a photograph or cook a meal or rearrange my bedroom or whatever it is, that thing that you're compelled to do to change something, right? A beginning mm -hmm. and end, right? That thing inside of me, it's not going anywhere. It's a hundred percent real. That's real. It doesn't mean I have to be a master at everything. Even the master is at some point on their learning curve, right? Everyone's in their learning curve. We are all allowed the dignity of whatever that is. And like when I'm in the company of those people who have all those things, they have the awards and they have the money and all the education and the this and the that and the blah, blah, blah. I just see that as cool. Something for me to strive for. What did they do? I'm going to find out what they did. I love like, this. It doesn't make sense to compare, right? Yes. And I also do my best not to copy anybody. When I was young, in my 20s, I think, as most people do, I did a lot of that, right? Yeah. I copied or I was trying to work in the style of this person, or the style of that person, because I liked it and it resonated with me. But that's what I mean by I just had to do that bad work to get it out of my system because along the way, I found the thing that makes sense to me and the thing that like I'm actually naturally inclined to. It's absolutely informed by that person, that artist, that person, definitely informed by it, but it's through me. So it's me. That's fantastic. I'm stuck on the, there's no such thing as imposter complex and that we make meaning out of what we're thinking. That when you see somebody else's art and you're like, I'm not there. So that must mean that X, Y, Z, I am not. And you are saying that you don't have that. Not to say that I haven't felt intimidated or I haven't felt like, ooh, this sure yeah. I've got like, ooh, that. But it's so temporary. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that we feed, we can feed on that and, and use I, it to not make work. Sorry. Yeah, and I just don't. I just don't. That's I fantastic. just. I just move on. I Because what else am I going to do? You know what I mean? A lot of people make the choice to decide something and then stop. I get that. I've had my moments where I've stopped, but there were also a lot of sort of outside forces going on. Like I, I was strung out. I had to get clean. I was in a relationship that needed my attention. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, life. life. Life stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that thing inside of me, that pilot light, that desire has never gone away. And there's dozens of outside forces that are going to try to kill that thing inside of you, whether it's family or a stupid boss at work or bad teachers or alcoholism, drug addiction. All those things are going to try to like put out that pilot light and mine never went out. That's why I'm like, I'm real, I yes, guess. Yes, you are. I love that. Thank you so much for taking us on this journey with you. I learned so much and I want to listen to it again. And I took notes when you were talking. There are just oh. so many little nuggets of wisdom in there that can be so helpful. They're helpful to me in my practice. And I know that the people that take my classes or are listening who get a little stuck in perfectionism or are unsure why they make work or all of the things that can trip us up. There are so many nuggets in here that can help free you from that and just the thought that like the pilot light is on keep going that's it yeah and just, your class was great taking your class uh self-portraiture as medicine a good it was a super great turning point for me because you know like i've been shooting for it was good to just get work done that came from a different perspective i'm not someone who tries to figure out the why so much I try not to figure out the why so much because I'm like, even if I get the answer, what am I going to do with the answer? I don't know how the answer is supposed to help me. So I'm just going to keep on doing this thing. But taking your class, I, get, 
I like that what you talked about in that class a lot was what can fill in for me. It's a self portrait. Oh, yeah. But does that mean it's me or does it mean it's a person, place or thing or idea that represents me? Yeah. Yeah. And that was super helpful for me because it got me thinking more about symbolism. And I think I, I was at a point, too, in my practice where I was start, starting to get a bit rigid and it helped me to realize I actually don't like my work to be rigid. <laughs> so yeah. Why am I trying to do that? It was it was like the perfect thing at the perfect time. It was the, oh. the perfect introduction of ideas at the perfect time. Thank you for saying that. And I loved having you in class. Your work is just fantastic Thank and you. inspiring. And I'm so glad that I keep getting to see more and more of it because you don't stop. <laughs> There's no reason to stop. <laughs> no reason, people. I just want to say thank you for spending I'll time with me thank today. Thank you back. Hey, you're welcome. But I really learned a lot. And I feel like some of the things that go on in my mind and people that are listening, the internal chatter, you can just decide to not get hooked by what your thoughts are saying to you and make the work. Yeah, you can do both things. You can have all those thoughts and the chatter. And keep going. Still move your paintbrush or still move the pencil or still click the shutter. or Make a bad work and get out of the way. Just do it. Thank you so much for being here. I adore you. This was fantastic. I love having these conversations with Me you. Me too. So. Me too. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. And for those of you listening, thank you for listening. Ciao for now. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Into the Deep with Catherine Just. You can check out all other episodes and help support the podcast over on katherinejust.com forward slash podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, comment, and review over on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen to this podcast. You can share this episode on social media. I look forward to having my voice in your ears next time. Take care.